Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts 17, 26. There's some of you, how many of you were there yesterday? Yes, most of you were there. So, and for many of you, this is your first time here in Matt and I. For many of you, this is your first time here in Matt and I share this, this story together. And, uh, so, you know, it, it messes me up when we share it together, honestly. The man makes me cry all the time, just being around. The story is so profound. I was crying earlier doing worship, and I looked over at him and said, you jerk, I love you. Because <laughs> that's all he does is make me cry. <laughs> Acts 17, 26. It says this, and he had made from one every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, have determined their appointed times and the bounds of their habitation. That they should seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Now turn me to John 17. And while, uh, while you're turning there, I just want to let you know that we, our book has actually finally been launched three and a half years worth of research into our deep, profound story. And uh, we, we can only hit on the tip of the iceberg of it with uh, our time with you today, but we do have it available today here. It's called The Dream King, how the dream of one of the king is being fulfilled to heal racism in America. We had that book here today actually being launched from this church today. So... <laughs> So I'll be available for you. Uh, John 17 says this, uh, starting at verse 17. Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. As thou didst send me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be the sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone. So he's not talking about the disciples right now. He's talking about us, but for those also who believe in me through their word. So Jesus praying this prayer, and he has you in mind. And here's what he says. That they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me, and the glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfected in what? Unity. That the world may know that thou hast sent me, and didst love them, even as thou didst love me. And let me pray for you, Jesus God, we're so blown away by this amazing grace in which we get to stand. God is such a good gospel, and you're such a good Savior. I've never met anyone like you in my whole life, Jesus. You're the most considerate person I've ever met in my whole life. To think that the one that we should fear the most is the one who loves us the most. And the fact that you love us so much that you'd rather die than spend eternity without us blows my mind. I've never met anyone like you in my whole life, the way you're so powerful and so considerate and so tender and how you handle delicate, frail human beings is mind-blowing. And we love you today. We thank you for this amazing good gospel that we get to share and that we get to do life with you and with each other. Thank you for this wonderful way that you're weaving all the tapestries of our lives together in this unending eternal thread of a family called the household of faith. I'm so thankful for what you're doing, God. Now I ask you today, increase the household, God. Bring other people to the table of brotherhood, even today. Release, Lord, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Do what you do best and what you love most to do. Make us love Jesus more than we did before we first came in here. We'll be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So some of y'all, if you're wondering why this old pot is up here, <laughs> Yeah, I wanted the same thing uh, years ago. I was 16 years old, and I remember seeing this pot in my, my, my grandmother's backyard. And my grandmother told me when I was 15, 16 years old, she said, Pookie, that's my nickname. Don't y'all call me that. <laughs> Pookie, God, Pookie, I believe God's going to use you with that pot. So I'm going to make sure that uh, 
when I die, your daddy's going to get this pot. But I'm going to make sure this pot going to come to you because God's going to use you with this pot. Little did I know. And she told me this story how the pot was used. And my father I corroborated the claims with my father. My father said, yeah, when I was five years old, I used to wash clothes in this pot. He said, uh, but back then, you know, they didn't have washing machines, so his feet were the agitators. So he would wash clothes in this pot. He would, they call it trumping clothes. How many of y'all remember some of that, some of the old things? He said, I would trump clothes in this pot. My great-great-grandmother, Harriet Lockett, would tell me the story, how they used this pot. Yeah, they used it for cooking. They used it for washing clothes, but they also used it for something else. Now, honestly, I hadn't thought much about it until uh, I got caught up in this whole thing, fell in love with prayer and pursuing God. And that's what you're going to find out through this whole story. Listen, God has an ordained plan and purpose for every single person that's here right now. And a lot of times it's connected to the unfinished business of people in your family, in your region, even the whole nation. God has unfinished business that's connected to your life. And we're standing on the shoulders of some great people, even in our own families, let alone people in the whole country. So, it's this whole thing of Providence. Matter of fact, this kettle pot comes from Lake Providence, Lake Providence, Louisiana. You know, uh, uh, Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary says that Providence is the continuous activity of God by which he preserves and governs. It's the way God looks over seemingly insignificant things and apparent accidents. So think about it. On the way here, you have no idea how many things God stopped in terms of traffic accidents and other things. You had no idea what he stopped, right? Wars, he gets himself involved in and stops them before that happens. Other things. And I like the way the New Testament talks about providence. Uh, it's uh, Ephesians 2 and 10 where it says that we are God's workmanship. And we're walking out the works that he prepared beforehand for us to walk in. That word workmanship is the word poema. Everybody say poema. poema. So you hear the word poem in there, right? So think about it. You're God's poem. You're his song. But even greater than that, the word poema was the word that was used to describe a skillful tailor and a fabric maker. God has a tailor-made plan and purpose and destiny for your life. Right, And so when you look at one part of that tapestry, you see one side of it, man, it's all tattered and it's all knotted up. But every now and then the poema will turn it around to see, let you see what he's working on. I think that's what we are right now. We're in a, in a place right now where the, the great poema itself is turning everything around to, to let us see what he's working on. This beautiful tapestry that he's working on. And uh, the way you step into what God is doing Honestly, what we, the way you step into what Providence is doing is through prayer. It's through prayer. I love, what, uh, I love what the Archbishop of Canterbury said once. He said, when I pray, the coincidences, the coincidences happen, but when I don't, they don't. When, in other words, when I pray, the coincidences happen, but when I stop praying, the coincidences stop. What you're about to hear is this uncanny way where all these uncoincidental coincidences happen in my life and connected all of us together in a deep, profound way. So, uh, like I said, I wasn't thinking about this part uh, during this particular time of my life. I began to pray for revival, and uh, God broke my heart for revival in America. I started reading a book. I read a book by um, Bill Bright, and in that book, he asks, he, he puts a prayer in there. He said, God, give me two million people who will do a 40-day fast for revival in America. I said, God, make me an answer to that man's prayer. So, I start a 40-day fast, liquid fast, first one ever. First day of it, somebody spray-painted my neighbor's car in my neighborhood. I said, God, what do you want me to do? He said, start prayer walking your neighborhood. How many of y'all prayer walk your neighborhood? All right, if you don't, start. Because, listen, everywhere the sole of your foot tread, God gives it to you. Listen, powerful things begin to happen, even in my neighborhood. I got a chance to share the gospel with people I hadn't shared before. I got to share the gospel with people who were Muslims of the religious. saw folks get saved. I prayed for people who were sick. I saw them healed. But greater than that, God broke my heart for revival in America. And all I could do was just walk and weep and pray for revival. Now, I get up early in the morning and go lay at night because, you know, I had that one little neighbor, you know, who was like Gladys Kravitz <laughs> on the, you know, looking through the, through the window shade. And there he goes again. He's crying again. I don't know what it's about, but I got my eye on him. Because <laughs> I was a wreck just walking and weeping and praying for revival. But little did I know, Mr. Poem was connecting me to some unfinished business. So, Go to this powerful prayer meeting called the Call 
didn't know anybody there. But then a few months later, there was this huge prayer gathering. Uh, not too big, but a small prayer gathering there in Colorado Springs. And I felt like, man, I need to be there because some of the people who I saw at this event was there. And so I get there, and this is where everything starts connecting. I get there, and there's this little lady named Cindy Jacobs, who I didn't know at the time. And she's praying for another man named Dutch Sheets, who I didn't know at the time. And while she's praying for Dutch, she calls up another young man named Billy Olson. She starts praying and prophesying over them that they would go to Williamsburg, Virginia, and do prayer and revival meetings. And then Cindy stops, and she says, hold up, there's something to this, because Dutch, his real name is William. Because Billy, his real name is William. Does anybody know what William means? And I'm in the back of the room, and I just kind of blurred out and said, it means noble spirit, resolute protector. She said, that's right. Who said that? I was like, ah. Cause I'm just trying to be a fly on the wall, right? So I just kind of poked my hand up. She said, you are William too, aren't you? You know, little prophet lady. You are William too, aren't you? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, get down here. Then she says, it's too white up here anyway. Come on down. <laughs> but when I come down, listen. When William Dutch Sheets and William Billy Olson and me, William III, when the three of us get connected together, the Spirit of God falls on all three of us. We had never met each other before. And then Dutch Sheets looks at me with tears in his eyes and says, hey, when we do this prayer gathering to Williamsburg, I believe you're supposed to come with us. Now, honestly, I thought this would be like any other conference in any of the other, you know, church camp or whatever. We're just going to exchange phone numbers and we're never going to hear from each other again. <laughs> so I was prepping my heart for that, right? But little did I know, Mr. Poema was knitting us together, and Dutch shared this powerful message. I'll share a little snippet of it with you in just a second that really connected us together. And so uh, we started talking about the kettle and what it represented, and, uh, and it turned into this prayer gathering, a prayer journey we were going to do together called the Kettle Tour. And then so he said, you know what, not only do we want to go to Williamsburg, we decided we're going to do all of New England and the Northeast and pray for revival and go to these key spots where revival broke out with Finney and Edwards and Wesley and all that. He said, but we need to pray for confirmation, of course, but I think this is the Lord. So I said, God, do you really want me to do this prayer gathering with this guy? And so here's what happens. Dutch finally sends me the names of all of the cities that he wanted to go to on this prayer journey. And when he sent it to me, all of them, except for about two, were names of streets in my neighborhood that I've been prayer walking. <laughs> for example, went to Jamestown, the original settlement. Jamestown Court was across the street from me. Went to Princeton University. Princeton Street was two streets behind me. Went to Hanover, New Hampshire. Hanover Street was next to Princeton Street. Went to Dartmouth University. Dartmouth Court was four streets down. Went to Nueva, Connecticut. Nueva Court was one street down on the left. Went to Gettysburg. Gettysburg Street was around the corner from me. Literally, I could go on. And after I had the cities represented, I had the region represented. For example, went to the Chesapeake Bay Area, and this is called that whole area, the Chesapeake. And at that time, I lived on Chesapeake Street. So why would God do this with a white man named Dutch and a black man named William III? Well, it turns out that the Dutch, that nation, they were the first ones to send slave ships into America in 1619. Next year marks the 400th year anniversary of that. Matter of fact, August the 25th. William III, that king from England, was the first king from England to send slave ships into America. God was saying, I want to use your relationship to show that I want to reverse the effects of yesterday's pain. He turned around the tapestry just a little bit so we could see exactly what he's working on. See, God has made from one blood many nations and determined the bounds of our habitations, time beforehand, the color of our skin, the, 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 the families we're going to be born into, the communities we're going to be a part of, so that we can seek after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. You know what he means when he says, so we can seek after him. Another translator says, to grope after him. The word grope is, is to feel after. In other words, you ever go into the, if y'all grew up in the, you know, with those, you had the, you had the grandmother, what a big mama who had the, the house in the country, right? Right? And then they didn't have the light switch on the wall. Where was the light switch, y'all? In the center of the room. Yeah, you know, in the center of the room, right? And it was always on one little string. It had a little bell shaped thing at the end. I don't know why it was a bell, because it was no bell, it didn't ring. Right, and, and so if the light was off, you walk into that room and you have to go like this. Right, you walk along, you're trying to find that one little, you're trying to hit that string, and then you, when you finally hit it, you put your hand in place and hold it so it can come down so you can turn the light on. That's what it is to grope and to feel. Listen, that's what God is saying right now. He wants us to grope and feel after him. We're walking by faith and not by sight. And we're trying to feel after where we can turn the light switch on and put, bring the light of the glory of the gospel back on in the country, back on in our nation, back on in Atlanta, back on in Georgia. 
And it, it works a whole lot better when we can walk together and do it. That's what we're doing right now. So this teaching that Dutch had was on synergy. Synergy is when you take two separate things and when you connect them together, they don't create an addition of power but a multiplicity of power. Scientists say you have two horses that they're pulling the same load. It creates so much exponential power, it's as if a third invisible horse has been added. Spiritually, we know that one could put a thousand to flight and two could put what? 10,000, that's synergy. So think about it. We started getting all this agreement in prayer between red, yellow, black, and white. We started getting agreement in prayer between old and young, male and female. We can see the synergistic exponential release in the power of prayer like we never seen before. Yeah. Psalm 133 says it best. How good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in what? Yeah. Unity. is like the anointing oil flowing from Aaron's head onto his beard and onto his robe. And the Bible says, for there, everybody say there. The Lord commands the blessing, life forevermore. God's looking for a place called there. It's the place where we drop our agendas, come together, and believe. Then Dutch said this. She said something that was so profound. He said, not only can you agree in prayer with the person sitting next to you, you can also agree in prayer with the generation behind you. He talked about how he's at his alma mater, his Bible school. And he was leading the student body in prayer for revival. And while he was leading them in prayer here at the Holy Spirit, speak to him and said, Dutch, I want you to come in agreement with the prayers of the founder of this school. And he said, okay, God, is this really you? Because that man's dead. He's been dead for more than 30 years, and I know you're not talking to the dead. And the Holy Spirit said to him, but his prayers aren't dead. That's still alive before my throne. There are things I promised this man in prayer that I want to release into this school, but I can't do it yet because I need this generation to come to agreement with that generation. I want to release the synergy of the ages coming together. So it's like an Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God promised this man back here in nation and raised up an Isaac and a Jacob. Brace that Jacob thing off there, boy. Names him Israel because he promised this man back here in nation. And what he did for Israel is just as if he'd done it for Abraham. Finally, that scripture made sense to me where it says, Hebrews 11, 39 and 40, all these by faith, they were approved for their faith, but they did not receive what was promised so that apart from us, they wouldn't be made perfect without us. In other words, there's a whole company of people looking over their balcony in heaven saying, hey, Billy Humphrey, hey, Matt Lockett, hey, Will Ford, don't mess this thing up because God started something in us that he wants to complete exponentially through you. Jesus said it best because he said greater works than these are you going to do because I'm going to the Father. And they'll start something in one generation and complete it exponentially for future generations to come. This helped me understand Psalm 133 in a, even a deeper light because see, Psalm 133 is not just about us coming to agreement with what God started in our today. It's also about agreeing what he started in our yesterday. Why do I say that? Because the garments of the priesthood, they were passed down. See, back in that day, when they would anoint a priest, see, we anoint somebody today, we put a little oil on our finger and we thump somebody on the forehead and we call it a day. That's not what they did back then. They would take a gallon of oil, some scholars would say, and they would pour that, all that oil over that high priest's head. And that oil would drip down from his head onto his beard, onto his robe. Listen, that one robe was then passed down to the next high priest. But then he received an anointing to make him relevant in his today. But as that oil dripped down, it mingled with the oil that was on the robe from the past. Then that same robe was passed down to the next high priest. In other words, there's supposed to be this momentum building anointing that goes from generation to generation to generation. The saturation of the ages, if you will. Everybody's looking for the next woman that I lose something. They're looking for the next purpose driven this or that. Those are great titles. Those are great authors. But here's the deal. God's not after originality. He's looking for a successor. And to a successor, here at least a double portion of anointing on them that's so powerful and not only make them impactful in that generation, but make them a springboard for future generations to come. That's the first little bit of his message. And I'm a wreck because I remember this pot in my family. Like I said, it was used by the slaves in my family. They used it for cooking. They used it for washing clothes. But secretly, it was used for prayer. They were owned by a slave master in Lake Providence, Louisiana, who had an overseer who would beat those slaves for any reason, and praying was one of them. So the irony of the peculiar institution is that they wanted slaves to be Christians because they knew that Christian slaves made better workers. But they would pervert the gospel and say, slaves be obedient to your masters if you want to go to heaven. Of course, it was easy to teach slaves that back then because it was against the law for slaves to read and write, and it was also against the law for anybody to teach them how to read and write. 
So they knew the Christian slaves made better workers, but they did not want them to pray because they knew that if they prayed, it would foster hope. And if they got hopeful, they'd run away. So this man would literally beat him if he heard him praying. Give an example of how cruel slavery was on this plantation. We had the story passed down in our family about a man named Uncle Willie who went fishing without asking. So the overseers decided to make an example out of him. So they strapped him to a tree and put both arms and legs around either side of that tree. They then took a leather strap, which was shredded, which had rocks and nails and glass attached to it, something like the cat of nine tails. And they beat this slave forefather of ours until all the flesh was pulled out of his back. The family, in their effort to save his life, took lard or grease and put on a huge sheet, wrapped it around his body to stop the flow of the blood. But in spite of their efforts, because of the man's cruelty, he bled to death and died. So that's how cruel slavery was on this plantation. And if they were heard praying, they would be beaten as well. But listen, the folks who kept this part in our family, who, who were slaves, they were Christians. And they decided to pray anyway. What they would do is they'd go into a barn late at night to make sure their prayer meeting was not seen. But to make sure that it wasn't heard, they used this pot as an acoustic means to keep their prayers from being heard. So what they would do is they'd walk in with this pot, and then they would turn it upside down on the cabin floor. They would then take rocks and prop up the edges so it would be suspended off the ground about an inch or two. They would then lay flat on the ground and put their lips in between the opening, between the ground and the kettle, so that the kettle muffled their voices as they prayed through the night. And the story that was passed down with this pot is this, is that they didn't think they would see freedom in their time, so they prayed for the freedom of their children and the next generation. One day, freedom did come. A young teenage girl decided to keep this pot and this story in her family. Why would she do that? She's probably thinking about all those who are dead and gone, who risked their lives to pray for her. She's probably thinking about all those who are too old to enjoy the freedom she's about to embrace. So she keeps this pot and this story in her family, and she passed it on to her daughter, Harriet Lockett, who then passed it on to her daughter, Noah Lockett, who then passed it on to her son, William Ford Sr., who then passed it on to William Ford Jr., who then gave it to me, William Ford III. So I'm there at this conference. I'm thinking about the heart that God had given me for revival. I'm thinking about how he's made me a spiritual father and a mentor to youth. I'm thinking about this kettle. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, to whom much is given, much is required. But then I think about the privilege of coming in agreement with what God started with my forefathers. I'm thinking, my God, I could come in agreement with the prayers of my forefathers for the freedom of this next generation. And I thought about the exponential results that could be released and created from that. I was sharing this with Dutch, and he says, you know, Will, I was praying for confirmation about this kettle pot. He said, God, you really want me to use some old cast iron cooking pot to represent the prayer bowls in heaven? Listen, Revelation 5 and 8 says there are bowls in heaven full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. There's a prayer bowl over your family. There's a prayer bowl over your community. There's a prayer bowl over Atlanta. There's a prayer bowl over this nation. God's looking for a new generation to resource the prayer bowls. Want me to use some cooking pot to represent the prayer bowls in heaven? Dutch said, his Bible fell open to Zechariah 14 and 20. Part B of that verse says, and the cooking pots in the house of the Lord. So be like the bowls before the altar. <laughs> so here's this cooking pot that's called muffled prayers the same way as a bowl in heaven that catches up prayers like incense. Then Dutch said this. He said, wouldn't it be just like God in his justice and irony? They use the prayers of a slave generation to free a nation up for revival again. I'm glad he said generation because it wasn't just black Christian slaves praying. It was white Christian abolitionists praying as well who knew that any person who was a slave was a Christian. They knew that person was their brother. And they laid their lives down for each other. Many had their houses burned. They were shot. They were killed. They were lynched because they chose to suffer with the people of God rather than compromise and weaken slavery. And it was the prayers of that godly remnant of white Christian abolitionists and black Christian slaves that prayed into being the first and the second great awakening. Had it not been for those revivals, slavery would have never ended in this nation. And I learned something from those abolitionists. They were willing to lay down their lives for somebody who didn't look like them because they knew they were connected because of the blood of Jesus. 
That's why I love to tell people, see, if my ancestors have been Muslims or Buddhists, I have connection to this part of its history. But because they were Christians, listen, not only these, my ancestors and forefathers, they're yours too. In other words, I'm just as much a spiritual son of Charles Finney and Jonathan Edwards as you are Martin Luther King and William Seymour. And when we come together in that kind of unity, that kind of agreement, something powerful happens. The oil begins to flow. Anointings begin to mingle. Breakthroughs get released. A commanded blessing finds a place to rest. It was the prayers of that godly room that prayed into being the first and the second great awakening. There was a Supreme Court law back then called Dred Scott, which says slaves had no rights. But because of revival, the hearts of the people in the nation were so, so powerfully changed and transformed. That law was broken in the hearts of people in this country. Every, everybody thought it was set a law. All of a sudden, it was eradicated. So listen, the same God who broke the power of Dred Scott, he can break the power of Roe v. Wade. He can put an end to systemic poverty. He can stop our schools from being a pipeline to prison. He can stop, shut down mass incarceration. He's just looking for a new generation of people who will drop their agendas, come together and believe. Say abortion, because listen, when the people that we cannot see become optional, it's inevitable that some of the people that we can see will become marginal. He weeps over all the shedding of innocence, but the same God who wept over Philando Castile and the five police officers that were killed in Dallas, he's the same God who weeps over 60 million babies that have been aborted in this nation. God's saying, drill down deeper. Life matters. Life itself. And he starts speaking to me about how he wanted to release a new civil rights movement that would include everybody this time, even the unborn. And so he gave me this dream about the dream of Dr. King. <laughs> In the dream, I'm on my way to Dexter Avenue Baptist Church with Lou Engle in the dream to do a prayer meeting, do a reconciliation service. Dexter Avenue Baptist Church was the church that Dr. King started in and where the civil rights movement got started. So in the dream, we're on our way to that place, but in the dream, we couldn't get there until we first picked up Dr. King. Sidebar note, there's some things we better pick up from our past so we can move forward in the right direction. So in the dream, we go by this house to pick up Dr. King. Of course, he's alive. So we go by this house, and Dr. King comes out, and he has this huge white duffel bag with him, which, which had black handles on it. And in the dream, he starts emptying all this dark garbage out of that duffel bag, and he throws the bag down violently, and he comes to get into this vehicle with us. And in the dream, I thought to myself, man, that bag can make a nice souvenir. So is y'all corner lamb, right, even in dreams. I'm thinking, I went to Morehouse College, he went to Morehouse College, the bag will make a nice souvenir. <laughs> so in the dream, I go to try to pick up the baggage, but before I could touch it, Dr. King grabs me by my shoulders, and he says, no, do not go back and pick that up. And in the dream, he tells me what I need to do to heal the race issue in this nation. I just begin to weep. I wake up from the dream. I didn't even realize it. I had been weeping in intercession the whole night. My pillow was soaked with tears. I shared this dream with my friend, Lou Engle. He begins to weep. We're like, God, what's the interpretation? I said, God, remind me. What did Dr. King say to me? And then the Lord said to me, William, the white bag with the black handles, that would be your interpretation. Then I realized I knew exactly what my baggage was. So I know what it's like to be 13 years old and come out of a convenience store with three of my friends and have a carload full of white guys chase us and call us the N-word and say they're going to shoot and kill us just because they wanted the joy ride. They did that for over an hour and a half. I know what it's like to be 19 years old and be in a, in a, in a, in a, in a grocery store and a plain clothes cop falsely accused me of shoplifting. When he couldn't prove it, he began to say ugly things to me to provoke me into a fight so I retaliate. I know what it's like to be in my 30s and get my first home in a nice neighborhood, but the same police officer for the first three months, at least twice a week, stopped me for just driving while black. I know what that's like. But you know what I've done? What I've done, those only three encounters, I put that on every single white person in that region and every single police officer. I put those particular instances up on them. Basically, I, it's a fellow pray to the accuser. Revelation 12 says that the devil is what? The accuser of the brethren. You know what that word accuser there is? It's the word categoros. It's where we get the word category. 
In other words, the diabolical plot of the devil is to get us to stereotype and categorize each other so that when we have one bad experience with one person, we have put that on everybody else that looks or reminds us of them. God is saying to us, get rid of your bitterness, get rid of your unforgiveness, get rid of your resentment, get rid of your guilt manipulation, get rid of your white baggage so we can all get a new vehicle that can bring revival and justice for everybody. So the question God has for all of us today is this, what color is your baggage? Get rid of it because we need each other. Because only a united church can kill a divided nation. So we actually had this prayer meeting there in Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. I had this big 600-page book with me called Testament of Hope. All the writings and speeches of Dr. King. All of a sudden, it just falls open to the I have a dream speech. I get to this part in the speech where he says, I have a dream that one day the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners can sit together at the table of brotherhood. And for the first time, I started praying for the family that used to own us. Praying for the family that owned Escaldo. So Lou asked me, hey, we're doing this prayer gathering January 17, 2005 at the Lincoln Memorial. It'll be MLK Celebration Day. Bring the pot, share this dream, tell your story. But little did I know, Mr. Poem was connecting me to some more unfinished business. Matt Lockett, dear friend, come on up. Share. Share your heart. Love you, brother. Got it. <laughs> this is, it is easy to preach here. Banana. This is exciting. Uh, I feel like we're in a moment collectively right now. I think, I'm just willing to believe in faith that, that this same moment, maybe, what if it's just happening all over the city of Atlanta this morning? This isn't just the excitement of the event being done. There's something more. Like I've felt that, right? We've felt the release and the relief of putting a lot of work into an event and it being complete and then you get to exhale. But this is different. There's something else going on. I went up on top of that rock yesterday. Probably, and I'm, I'm in Washington, D.C., but when I was on top of that rock yesterday, I felt like it was a Caesarea Philippi moment for me. I don't know how it feels for you because maybe you've been there before, but that was my first time there. I felt like it was a moment of intersection between our timeline and God's timeline, that something genuinely unique was, was happening. And so I have so much faith for moments like that. I have faith for prayer meetings when you just show up and you don't know why you're there. You know, sometimes you just got to show up and then let God show up. You know what I'm saying? So my part of the story, yes. So Matthew 16, he wants me to explain what, what I mean by Caesarea Philippi. Um, in Matthew 16, Jesus takes his disciples up north and they go to this place. It says that they come to the district of Caesarea Philippi and that's where he says, who do men say that I am? And then he, he commissions, you know, Peter in that moment, not in a Catholic moment, but he says, not, not a, I'm not going to build my church on you, Peter. I'm going to build my church on the revelation that I am the Christ. But there's another dimension to this where he says, upon this rock, that commentators believe that they were actually at this place called, the, it was literally called the gates of hell. And uh, there were, there were uh, false gods that were worshipped there, Pan specifically and other stuff, all kinds of debauchery and, and evil things happened there, but it was literally a, a gateway to hell. And Jesus took his disciples to that spot 
to declare who he was. And some commentators say, say it like this, that he was literally saying, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell. He's literally pointing at this this stronghold of Satan, this stronghold of demonic oppression and principality and power in the earth. Upon, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Yesterday felt like one of those kinds of moments to me. No, really. Like, I don't know if you feel the weight and the gravity of that, but yesterday, again, it, we, we said, it was said a hundred times, but this, it was not just another pep rally. I think the church of Atlanta showed up to do business so that now the church in America can do business. So Will brought up the, the, the story up to this moment. It was January 17th, 2005 in Washington, D.C., actually on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, the great emancipator, and uh, I want to hit pause there on the story for a second and back up just a little bit so you can understand how my story kind of dovetails into Will's story. I want to actually go back a year, one year to the day exactly. It was January 17th, 2004 that my father unexpectedly passed away. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a traumatic experience for anybody. But uh, for me as a believer, and maybe you can relate to this, I see some... Uh, uh, younger people in the room, so maybe you haven't gone through the experience of losing mom or dad yet, but you will. And uh, just think for a moment how much you depend on mom and dad. When you get to a moment like that where you lose them, something really profound happens where you've spent your entire life hearing the stories of where you've been and what you've done and who you are. Suddenly now, you become the steward of the storyline. The mantle of the, of the storyteller now falls on your shoulders. And so you, as a believer, you need to start asking some really important questions in those times. And for me, that I was no different. And so you start asking things like, who am I? God, why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? Listen, those aren't weak questions. That's, that's, that's not a sign of weakness. Those are really good good questions that your heavenly father wants you to ask, not just when you're young, but at every stage of life. Now, what are these works that you've prepared for me to do in advance? And so really what it comes down to, and what I loved about yesterday is this is not going to be an event of speaking. Today is a day of stories. And, and really, this is, really, this is what we ought to be doing with our lives. It's what is the story that I'm supposed to be telling with my life? And so that was actually a really painful question to be faced with for me because in my family, we didn't know who we were or where we came from. My dad was actually one of 16 siblings. Massive family. They grew, he grew up on a tobacco farm in Kentucky and Papaw needed slave labor. You didn't think that was funny? <laughs> 16 siblings, but somewhere along the way, there had been courthouse fires, there had been a breakdown of information where no one in my dad's generation knew where we came from beyond their grandfather. And more importantly, I would say it like this, that somewhere along the way, somebody stopped telling the stories. And so my dad would actually make a joke out of it. He would just say, well, we're just a bunch of mutts from Kentucky. But I know that it was a painful thing for him, you know, like with anybody, you want to know where did I come from? You know, what's happened in the past? And, you know, I often ask this in, in gatherings. I say, how many of you have researched your family genealogy? <laughs> Three, four, in a room this big. Now think about that. Something's going on. And, and I've been noticing this almost like a trend that I see fewer and fewer hands going up. And so what that tells me is that we, we're literally witnessing the breakdown of the story right now. We're losing history at an increasing rate. And I believe that we're in a moment in time where God is about to lift the curtain and reveal some things that he's been working on for a very long time. Things that we were formerly unaware of. And so this was the case with me. I didn't know who we were. And so I decided that I was going to do what no one else in my family had ever done. I got cousins upon cousins. 
And no one's ever been able to figure out our genealogy, but I said, I'm going to be the one to get the breakthrough. And I spent all of uh, that summer in 2004 trying to figure out, you know, where did we come from? And I hit all the same roadblocks that everyone in our family had ever hit. And I was finishing that year more frustrated than I began because I didn't, I didn't know anything. And it was during that time, it was actually September of 2004, 14 years ago, next month, that I had a dream. Now, this is going to be an easy room to say this in, but we're talking a lot about dreams this morning. So let's just hit pause for a second again. How many of you believe that you can go to sleep at night and that God can talk to you and pizza doesn't get all the credit? Yeah. Glory! Banana! <laughs> This is going to be so weird on the web stream. <laughs> Why are they preaching about bananas? So I had a dream during that time, and, and I won't go into the dream uh, in detail, but I had a dream about the ending of abortion in America and how God was going to bring that about through day and night prayer. And in my dream, there was a man named Lou Engel. Now, let me tell you why that was strange for me. Number one, I didn't know anything about prayer. Everybody thinks they know something about prayer until you show up in a real prayer meeting. Then you realize, I, I don't know nothing about prayer. <laughs> Somebody over here knows what I'm talking about. To me, like, listen, I got saved when I was 15 years old. And uh, uh, you, you think you know about prayer, but prayer is what you do on Wednesday night from 7 to 8 p.m., you spend 45 minutes talking about somebody's grandma with a broken hip, right? And 15 minutes praying for God to give her strength to endure her affliction. So many of us can relate to that, right? That just, you think you know that that, you know, that's what prayer is. But so I didn't know anything about prayer because of what I saw in this dream. But the other thing is I didn't know Lou Engel. I didn't know who Lou Engel was and I didn't know anything about abortion. Now, I say that, and that's important because for me, I, like I said, I've been a Christian most of my life, but abortion was one of those things that I was content to just let other people focus on that. You know, that's important to them. You know, it's not important to me. Other issues are important to me, right? And so we kind of allocate it, right, to those noisy people way, way over there. And, uh, uh, and I was one of those. I didn't know anything about it because I didn't want to know anything about it. I'm just being really honest with you. But I couldn't get away from this dream. It was, it was wrecking me. I actually say that it was haunting me because it wouldn't go away. You know, I would wake up in the morning and it was the first thing I was thinking about. I would go to sleep at night. It was the last thing I was thinking about. You wake up the next day, wash, rinse, repeat, you know? And so this went on for a couple of weeks. By then I found out that there was this real guy named Lou Engel and he was really doing something with prayer. And, uh, and I told my wife, I said, I, I think I'm supposed to do something with this dream. What a strange concept that you would have a dream that would demand that you do something about it. But God was beginning to tell a story and I was beginning to pay attention. And so I, I told my wife I was supposed to do something and she said, what do you mean? What, what, do, you, what do you mean do something with it? And I said, well, clearly I have the word of the Lord for them. So uh, I'm, I'm going to try to get in contact with them, and I'm going to drop that off at their door, and then I'll be done. <laughs> so through a friend of a friend of a friend, I got the phone number of somebody who worked with the Lou Engel. How many of you know Lou Engel? Yeah. Come on. And uh, I, I called him unannounced on the phone, and I said, hi, I'm Matt. I don't know you, and you don't know me, but I had a dream. And he goes, really? What was your dream? I totally didn't expect that. He totally took me seriously on the call. And so I told him the dream. And he said, this is very interesting. You've just dreamt exactly what the Lord has sent us to do. We're going to Washington, D.C. to pray for the ending of abortion. They had just, if you've heard Lou tell the story, they had just finished the 50 days and nights uh, back in 2004. And the Lord was sending them to D.C., he said, we're going to do a gathering at the Lincoln Memorial on, on MLK Day, 
uh, in January, maybe you should come there. God might have something for you there. Maybe, maybe some of you, I'm just willing to believe that there were people all over the state of Georgia that God said to them, just come to Stone Mountain. Maybe God will have something for you there. You just show up. And so I was one of those that, you know, I needed confirmation. God, do you really want me to do this, right? You lay out your fleece. Do something, God. Do something supernatural. <laughs> Prove it to me that it's you. And so I was standing in the kitchen one night, and uh, my oldest daughter, she was 10 years old at the time. My wife was pregnant with our youngest. But uh, my 10-year-old daughter, Taylor, she liked to read children's books to her younger brothers. And she walks into the kitchen one night, and she says, uh, she just had a strange look on her face, and she said, Daddy, I think I found something. And I thought, what a strange thing for a 10-year-old to say. And I go, well, tell me what you mean. And she has a, a book with her. She said, well, I was reading this book to my brothers, and it has something in it, and I think it's important. And I said, well, show it to me. And she opens it up, and it's a book by Dr. Seuss called Horton Hears a Who. And she says, there's this line repeated through the book that says, a person's a person no matter how small. And I thought, well, that's interesting. That very night, I opened my email, and I have one of these like mass email blasts from Elijah List or whatever it was, and it was a guest uh, article that had been written by a man named Lou Engel. And he was talking about how they had received a, a word uh, about how God was going to, there was a dream about how God was going to use an old children's book from the past to galvanize a new generation to stand for justice for the unborn. And it was the book doc, from Dr. Seuss, Horton Hears a Who. But God, if this is really you, I really need confirmation. <laughs> Amen or oh me, right? So what I, I look back now and I realize that God wasn't just inviting me into a story. I saw now that it, this was a multi-generational story that God was bringing us into. See, I, I decided that I was going to go to D.C. for this gathering and just show up. I didn't know why. My wife couldn't travel with me, so I decided to take my 10-year-old daughter with me instead. And it was the couple of months that I had to prepare for that. Listen, I had one prayer that I was praying I had gotten a recording of Lou Engle preaching, and I don't know what the message was, but there was this one line that he said in, in, in that message that has stuck with me my entire life since then. He said this. He said, what moves you? What is your passion? Stay close to the burning bush in your life. What burns in you and never goes out, when you find something like that, draw close to it and you'll hear your name called. Of course, he's talking about referencing Moses. Here's Moses just going about day after day, 40 years on the backside of the desert, taking care of somebody else's sheep, right? But then one day is different than all the other days. One day there's this bush that's on fire. That's not what's strange. I think Moses had seen a lot of burning bushes. What was different is that day there was a bush that didn't go out. How long did he look at it? How long did it take to realize that this thing's not going out? Listen, some of you have been looking at that bush for years, possibly even decades, and be thankful that God has the ability to set that thing on fire in your life and it doesn't burn out. Because it's not just that it's on fire and not going out. It says, when God saw that Moses turned aside to see, when Moses leans into the moment, then he calls out his name, Moses. And suddenly Moses finds himself stepping into a holy moment where he hears his name called. But not only that, I don't even know if he realized it, but what he was doing was stepping into a moment of God's unfinished business. See, 400 years before that, God had already told Abraham it's going to be 400 years, then time's up. Did Moses know? I don't know. But when he turns into the moment and hears his name, he's actually stepping into God's unfinished business that he was about to fulfill in that generation. And so I had one prayer that I was praying. God, remember, my dad had passed away and had gone through a very painful year. And I, was, I had one week prayer. God, I, I want to hear my name called. So I show up at the Lincoln Memorial. 
January 17, 2005. Now, I actually brought a little show and tell. I don't have a 100-pound kettle pot. I've got a PowerPoint. <laughs> Mine doesn't cost as much to fly with. <laughs> so if you, want, if you have that first image, if you could put it up, I want to show you uh, some images here. I'll show you a picture from that day. So this is it. This is a picture of that day. See, I just showed up. I didn't know why I had to go to a prayer meeting in D.C., I didn't know why it had to be outside. I didn't understand for the life of me why it had to last for eight hours in January when it was zero degrees outside. So I just brought a camera and started taking pictures. You can see the Lincoln Memorial in the background. If you look on the left side of the screen, that, that blue sleeve, if you follow it all the way up to the tip of the finger, that's Will Ford right there. So the first time that Will and I ever came together in the same place was on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And so we prayed that day. And uh, that evening, we went to Bishop Harry Jackson's church. He was with us here yesterday at the event. And uh, we uh, had a guest speaker that night. The conference did, and it was a man named Will Ford. And he brought out this iron pot. And he told the story that everyone here just heard. Now, it's been one year to the day that my father had passed away. I was already a raw nerve. And I'm listening, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm sitting on this pain that I have no idea where we came from, and, and, and then I'm listening to this story of this rich spiritual heritage of how they prayed for the nation and prayed for the, the next generation. And I'm just a mess listening to this. I'm weeping. And then he shared the part at the end that you've already heard. He said that this pot was handed down to Harriet Lockett who gave it to Nora Lockett, who gave it to Will Ford Sr., to Will Ford Jr., to Will Ford III, the man standing on the stage. And my 10-year-old daughter turned to me and said, Daddy, he just said our name. And what was my prayer? What was my one prayer going to that meeting? God, I want to hear my name called. I had no idea God would be that literal. But after the meeting, I went up. I was so intrigued by this. And I met Will and we talked and uh, we just thought, wow, this is amazing. And he said, how did the lockets in your family spell it with one T or two? And I said, two. He said, well, our lockets only spelled it with one T. Where were they from? And I said, well, we don't really know. We guess Kentucky. And he said, well, our lockets were down in Louisiana. And we thought it was just this amazing coincidence, but it was enough that it connected us as friends. Now, what God ended up doing with me personally was I ended up leaving a career in the marketplace. God called me and my family to, to move to Washington, D.C. and join with Lou Engel. We became full-time missionaries in D.C. We've been on Capitol Hill for, it'll be 14 years next month. J-Hop, D.C. But this connection that God made between Will and I, we just became friends and covenant brothers, and we began to run together and just do life together as best we could. Began to participate and lead prayer meetings around the nation, praying for revival, praying for racial healing, praying for the ending of abortion in America, just contending for the next generation. And just doing life together and trying to love each other well, I kind of think that's how this is supposed to work. So, fast forward. I uh, was in D.C., and uh, uh, my family was there, and God gave us a dream at the very beginning of J-Hop, and I want to share that dream with you because it's very important to the story. So God had sent us there to pray for the ending of abortion originally, but he gave us this dream that gave us very vivid language. So that it was this. In the dream, there was a huge building that was filled with courtrooms, and we were being led from one court to the next, and, and this pathway led all the way to a huge room, and on the door, it said Appomattox Courthouse. And in the dream, the Lord made known, he says, either you deal with Roe v. Wade in your courts, or I'll deal with it in mine. So you, you can understand, like, we, that dream has always been very, very sobering to us, because obviously that's referencing the American Civil War. If you don't know what Appomattox Courthouse is, let me give you a little American History 101. Listen, I went to art school, folks. 
I slept through government class, I slept through social studies, and I slept through history. All right, so I can relate. So let me just tell you a little bit about Appomattox Courthouse. See, 1861 to 1865, this nation fought a bloody civil war. New estimates say that 750,000 people lost their lives in that war, brother against brother. So we get to March of 1865, and up here in the state of Virginia, General Lee is holed up in Richmond and Petersburg, and the Confederate Army is, is there. The Union Army is, has put a siege on them in those cities, and then they break through and they begin hot pursuit across the state of Virginia. So Lee is trying to get to a place where he can get to resources. His men are starving. They're running out of ammunition. And they get to a little place called Sailor's Creek in the middle of the state. And when they get there, they get stuck and they can go no further. And so he turns the cannons around and they make this last stand in battle. And the last battle of the Civil War was fought on April 6th, 1865. Three short days later, he surrenders at nearby Appomattox Courthouse. And so that's what people are most familiar with is that there's a farmhouse there. Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. So the reason that's so sobering is for God to use Civil War language with us in terms of praying for the ending of abortion. We understand this is an issue of bloodshed in America, that the same God who wept over the shedding of the innocent blood of the African is the same God who weeps over the shedding of the blood of the, the baby in the womb. And we have had this prayer all of these years. God, we don't want to go back to another Appomattox. You understand what I'm saying? God, give us opportunity and the chance to deal with this in our courts. That's why we have to contend for the, the, the judiciary. We have to contend for the Supreme Court. Right now, even, we have to contend for the Supreme Court. And so we've prayed this all these years. God, we don't want to go back to Appomattox. Well, now... Fast forward a little bit. It was a few years ago. Lou was going to do one of these large call events in the state of Virginia. And so he called me and he said, if we're going to do this in Virginia, first we have to go to Appomattox and pray. See, we'd never actually gone there together and prayed. And so we knew we needed to beforehand. So we went there and you can actually go in the McLean farmhouse where the surrender took place. And, um, uh, we uh, uh, prayed for, at that time, we prayed for President Obama. We prayed for revival in America. We prayed for the ending of abortion. And then when we went to leave, there's a visitor's center. And we went in, and Lou and I stepped up to a bookcase side by side. And he grabs the first book off the shelf that caught his eye and opens it to the first random page. And I have an image of it I'd like to show you, if you could put that up. It's called The Last Shot, The Battle of Lockett's Farm. Lou let out a shudder and asked me, what is this? And I had no idea. I said, I don't know. So I bought the book. I began to research this topic. What I found out is that last battle of the Civil War, when Lee made that last stand, it was in the front yard of a family named Lockett. It said that he could go no further and he turned his cannons around in the front yard and then the Union Army emerged from the trees in the backyard and the historical account says that, as you can see, the Lockett farmhouse was all that stood between the two armies. And so I'm stunned by this, and I'm thinking, this has to mean something, because I'm in another holy moment where I feel like I'm hearing my name called, literally, again. But God, what does this mean? And it was about that time that my brother, my older brother Bob, he actually got the breakthrough on our genealogy. What, where we've always failed in the past, he... We got together and he said, I got us all the way back to 1645. We came in as settlers through Virginia. And I thought, wow, have I got a Virginia story for you? And I began to tell him this story about the Civil War. And he stops me and he says, that's not that place in Sailor's Creek, is it? And I said, that is exactly where it is. He said, I just found the documents on it. That was our family. So now you get this. So after all of these years of us praying into the dream that God gave us, God, we don't want to go back to Appomattox, I find out that the American Civil War, the last battle happened in my family's front yard. 
So I did what every good red-blooded American intercessor does. You put your team in a hot van and you try to go there. <laughs> oh, everything was against us that day. The air conditioning, it was July, and the air conditioning went out in the van. That's real, folks. <laughs> So I brought a picture, if you put the next one up. This is the house that's been preserved. That's the Lockett Farmhouse. If we could zoom in, I could show you that it's still riddled with bullet holes. It's still covered with scars from the day of battle where it's been preserved. And there in the front yard, there's a historical marker that says, here Lee fought his last battle. Listen, I believe... Uh, Based on these historical accounts that I've read, this is a picture of what the church is supposed to do to be a house that's willing to stand between the two brothers who are trying to rip each other apart. It's a picture of intercession. And it said that at the end of the day, once the battle was done, it said that that house became a hospital for both sides. And the floorboards were stained with the blood of both north and south. Listen, that is a picture of standing in the gap. And listen, I think that the bullet holes in the house are a message to us today. You will take some shots and you will, you will be, scars will be inflicted if you dare to stand in the gap for this nation right now concerning racial healing in America. But listen, it is so worth it if we can get to the place of healing. It's worth taking the shots. So we... We uh, get there, and, and uh, we were stunned by it, and uh, the man that lives there, he invited our team in. We walked in the living room, and I'm shocked when I look, and framed and hanging on the wall is the Lockett family genealogy, framed and hanging on the wall. I get out my brother's notes. It's a hand in a glove. It's my family. And he says, what do you know about your family? Not much. And he said, well, some of you left and went to Kentucky. I knew that part. And he said, some left and went to the deep south and were involved in some very significant historical events. But then he said this, some left and went to Louisiana. And in some cases, the handwritten ledgers had a misspelling and they dropped one of the T's in the spelling of the name. And I'm thinking, wait a minute now. God, I know you're really good at what you do. But are... Are you serious? Like, could this be real? So I gather up all this information and I go down to Dallas where Will and his family live and we just lay this out on a table. We stare at it and we begin to weep. Will, why don't you come back up and share with everybody what we found out? So. <laughs> Matt's a researcher. I'm a researcher. Billy, you know, we're, we're researchers. We, yeah. And... Uh, we don't like fluff, we like the you know, real things. So we started studying this stuff out. So my oldest known family member was a man named Isaac Lockett. He shows up in the 1870 census, living in Lake Providence, Louisiana. He's 90 years old there. So five years after slavery, this probably where this man was a slave. He hadn't moved because he's older. But in that census, he said he was originally from Virginia. The only lockets in Virginia at that time was Matt's family. So we did another year and a half of research, and here's what we learned from empirical evidence. Matt's family is the family that owned my family where this kettle pot came from. So think about it. Here's my family praying for the ending of slavery in Lake Providence, while Lake Providence. Maybe the lake of God's providence is way deeper and wider than we know. Maybe the color of our skin, the family that we're born into, maybe there's some redemptive, powerful work that God wants to release in our lives to display his glory. Praying for the ending of slavery, and then all the way up at the farmhouse of the people used to own them, slavery comes to an end in their front yard. But then because he's the God of the past and the future, he takes two people from those same family lines and weaves us together so we can war against injustice in our day and a cry for awakening in our time. Lord.
here's the other piece. There's other pieces of it. Which, again, there's more of it in the book. But the other thing we found out is too is that there was uh, these other family members of Matt who were amazing people for the Confederacy. They were like the socialites. They were the aristocrats. And uh, her name was Mary Lockett. Mary Lockett didn't like the fact that the uh, Confederate White House didn't have its own flag. If you put the picture up there, there's two people, Napoleon and Mary Lockett. And uh, so Mary Lockett didn't like the fact that the Confederates didn't have their own flag. So she actually had someone design, pay for them to design the very first Confederate flag. Wow. And she hand sewed it in her house and hand delivered it to her good friend, President Jefferson Davis. And if you go to the next slide, that's the, the very first Confederate flag there that's flying there, the stars and the bars. She came up with the idea for them to have the flag. In other words, Mary Lockett was the Betsy Ross for the Confederacy. But they thought that flag looked too much like the other flag, so they came out with the next flag, the Confederate battle flag, the next flag, you'll see it there. But listen, but because of praying people who are praying underneath kettle pots and white Christian abolitionists who are praying all around the country, listen, through the same family where the flag of rebellion was raised up in our country, next slide, the flag of surrender went up in their front yard. So, but then we find out something else. Tell them about Daniel. So would you agree, like, how, you have to understand how painful it was that after, after all of these years, you understand that it wasn't the story that connected us. We'd been praying together for about a decade as, friends. as when God began to reveal this stuff. And so to find out that my part of the story was connected to that of the slave owner, that was very painful for me. Like, I was being confronted with things where the, it wasn't just concepts anymore. It wasn't just other people, those people kind of things. Suddenly now I saw that the pain was real and this pain had a face and it was a face that I loved. And so I was being confronted with that. We'll probably talk about that more in a minute. But uh, once, the, fa once the, the, the curtain went up on the family line, it was glorious because yes, there were slave owners in my family, but when you went back a little bit further go back to the previous generation, we found something very interesting out. During the Revolutionary War revival, in spite of the war, revival came to the middle of Virginia. And it, I was reading a history book that the Lord led me to read, and I turned the page, and it says that, that uh, revival came, and uh, many men were added to the itinerancy of the Methodist circuit riders as a result, and it lists their names, and right there in the list was a man named Daniel Lockett. I get out the family research, there he is. We knew he was a pastor, we didn't know he was a circuit rider. Now that's significant because at that time in history, the Methodist circuit riders who had been inspired by the Quakers, they believed that they had to take a stand against the institution of slavery. And so these, these frontiersmen, they would carry the gospel, but more than just Bibles and hymnals in their horse saddlebags, they took what was called a manumission form which was a legal document that allowed people to set their slaves free. So they would preach. And when people would accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, they would say, it is for freedom that Christ sets you free. And they would give them the opportunity at the same time to set their slaves free. And what you see when you study history is everywhere those guys went, the population of freed slaves exploded throughout the mid-Atlantic region. So yes, we had slave owners in my family, but we also had abolitionists. So think about it. All of our families wear what's called generational curses and generational blessings. What they represent are these narratives that become dominating themes for whole families, right? So in my family, yeah, we had our people who in prison done stuff that we're not proud of. I've done stuff we're not proud of. But we had these folks back here contending for revival and the ending of slavery. Matt had family members, yeah, they owned slaves, but he also had a Daniel Lockett and others who taught slaves secretly how to read and write and were abolitionists. We have these dominating themes. And what God is saying right now, they have these dominating themes called storylines. And what God is shouting to America right now is this. What storyline do you want to be a part of, America? The healing of the hurt, the blessing of the curse. What storyline do you want to be a part of? Give you one last story here, an example of choosing a storyline. So it was illegal to teach slaves how to read and write before 1865, but guess what? Afterwards, still wasn't that popular. 
And so slaves continued in the legacy of secret meetings trying to teach each other how to read and write. So it's 1867, right there in the Lockett Homestead, they were in secret trying to teach their young son how to read and write, a family was, and they believed that if they were found out, there would be consequences. And so in one night walks Lucy Lockett and she catches them red-handed, a mother, former slave, trying to teach her son Robert how to read and write. Only instead of consequences, she sees it and she says, actually, what you're doing is great wisdom. And she takes over tutoring the young boy how to read and write. That young boy was Robert Moten. He replaced Booker T. Washington as the president of Tuskegee Institute. He tells this story in his autobiography. And in 1922, next image, he gave the dedication speech of the Lincoln Memorial. The very spot, listen, 41 years later, where Dr. King would stand and say, I have a dream. And 41 years exactly after that, Will and I would stand on that same spot and meet for the first time. So think about this. This happened to two men who were led by dreams to the Lincoln Memorial to a prayer meeting on MLK Celebration Day to the spot where Dr. King said in his I Have a Dream speech, I have a dream that one day the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners could sit together at the table of brotherhood on the Red Hills of Georgia. Maybe the dream speech wasn't poetry. Maybe it's prophecy. Maybe there's a dream king, the, dream, the king of kings, who prayed in John 17, Father, I pray that they will be one so that your glory could come, so that the world would believe. Maybe God hadn't given up on America because he remembered the prayers of our forefathers. And maybe out of a mountain of despair, there's a stone of hope. Why do I say that? That same mountain range, the stone mountain, that same granite stone, was taken, there was stone that was taken from Stone Mountain to create the Lincoln Memorial. Where Dr. King would do the I Have a Dream speech. God is up to something, and you have no idea what y'all have ignited and released from this powerful prayer meeting. So come on, let's turn this to a prayer meeting just for a little bit. See, here's the thing. This isn't just a crazy story between Will and I. I'm willing to believe that God's about to lift the curtain and reveal that he's been a storyteller teller for a very long time. That all of our lives have been intricately woven together and they've all brought us to this moment in time and in this place right now. God has prepared works in advance for each of us to do. This isn't just about Will, it's not just about me. This is about you, the life that God has given you at this time, right now. So, Father, we just pray right now. Come on. Mr. Poema. Ah. Master fabric maker. Ah. Lord, the storylines that you have woven together, God, we pray, God, that there would be grace today to not just stare at the knots and the mess on the backside. Lord, we spend our days looking at the knots and the mess. God, we ask you to turn it around, God, and reveal this beautiful tapestry that you've been weaving together. Lord, what you began with the prayers of our grandparents, God, what you prepared, God, even through the prayers of those generations that we've long since forgotten, God, we know that there's still prayers unanswered in those bowls. Yes, God. Prayers unanswered. God, in our family lines, prayers unanswered that you still intend to answer. God, we know that nothing is wasted. God, we pray, God, that you would begin to reveal it to us. Even this morning, God, in a moment like this, God, this stone mountain moment, God. Yeah. God, that the stone mountain revival would begin to break forth, God. That it would come, God, even as you are revealing these storylines, God, catch us up in the story that you are telling in Atlanta. Catch us up in the story, God, that you are telling to the entire nation. You are shouting, God, that you've been at work for a very long time, God. And though we've forgotten you, God, you are about to reveal yourself, God. 
You are about to put yourself and the work of your son on display yes. through brothers and sisters who love one another and are fulfilling your dream, your prayer of John 17. That we would be one, that the world might believe. God, use our lives as a testimony of the story that you're telling. Yes, a testimony, oh God, that shows how good you are. That the world might believe.